So I'm Merit Sakovich. Um, I'm uh, director of the Healy Center and chair of the department here. I just want to welcome all of you here. Thank you for coming. It's, it's so um, incredible to see a lot of um, familiar faces and friends and some new people. I'm really happy that you've, you've taken this beautiful Saturday and come and spent it to, uh, together with us. Um, and I'm hoping we're gonna really provide some uh, exciting new information about what's going on in ALS and have lots of time uh, to hear your questions and to, to really have a good dialogue about how together we can really conquer this illness. I'm really proud uh, that we have this amazing community of uh, clinicians and uh, patients and families who are really all working together to, to try to conquer ALS. So really because of all of you guys, we, we have the, you know, the largest um, ALS program in the country and the one I think is really most integrated in uh, bringing the research from the lab, many of them up, up here on the floor, uh, to our patients and making sure that you have access to everything that's out there. You know, I heard from uh, several of you, and we, we hear it in, the, in our clinic, how it's actually gotten a little overwhelming to know what the best thing is to do. And in a way, that's a good problem. It's one of the problems that we didn't have a couple of years ago. Uh, and that's because there's so much research going on, and there's so many options for people, and we want to make sure that you know about them. So this is just one of our ways that we do it. Um, but as you know, you can all reach us, really, anytime. Um, we want to be as inclusive as possible, and we have a lot of people that we care for that live out of state or who travel, so we are um, trying new technology today, new, new for us, old for a lot of other people, but it's, uh, we're live streaming on Facebook, um, so, but we do want to uh, keep your privacy, so the cameras, I think, are only forward. They're not on, so no one will see you. If you have a question that you want to ask that's, that you don't want live stream, you can write it and we'll, we'll read it without your name. Um, but we did want to make sure that everybody that we care for had an option to be, be with us today. And uh, we'll be taking some questions from them as well. And then we're also taping this so that we can put it on our, on our website. So it, it's hard to believe that we're actually reaching the one year mark of a really um, important event um, at Mass General, which was the launch of the Healy uh, and AMG Center for ALS here. And uh, really honored to have Sean here in the back of the room um, that I hope uh, many of you will get to meet. But it was really um, him and his friends and their vision um, and their uh, commitment to what they saw here um, that they're supporting uh, some amazing new initiatives that we're gonna tell you about. In particular, um, this new platform trial that we're just about to launch and that you might be um, sitting on a, a news article about. But uh, Sabrina and James will be telling you a little bit more about those, the therapies that we're gonna be bringing forward and uh, when that's gonna start. And um, I also wanted to acknowledge Jane. I don't know if Jane's here. Jane Williamson? Not yet. Okay, when Jane comes in here, I want to uh, uh, point her out too because she's been a long, long time supporter and has really given us amazing ideas of how we can keep improving our clinic and keep giving better care for our patients. So um, I want to tell you about a few things that we're doing. The goal of our center is, is to take the best care of patients with ALS and their families and also to accelerate uh, developing treatments so that we can eventually close the clinic and not have to have, to have one. So uh, some of the initiatives we're um, gonna talk about are ways to really bring things from the lab to patients sooner. We wanna do that in trials, but we also wanna have something called expanded access so that if for whatever reason someone can't be part of a trial, that they still have access to treatments. So we have a really burgeoning expanded access program that we'll talk to you about. We have some amazing scientists that work upstairs and we want to try to make sure that they spend as much time um, as they can in the lab and less time writing grants. So some of the what we do in the Healy Center is to support uh, science both here as well as really throughout the world uh, through Healy Scholars. Um, and we want to attract new people into the field because we need the smartest and the brightest coming to help us. So really through the Healy Center, we're giving out um, scholarships to people really all over the world. Um, the, the other thing that we're doing that I think is very exciting that is we're giving out the very first award ever to a team that has uh, made a 
huge breakthrough that can develop treatments better for people with ALS. So we had our first call for that, and we got 12 nominations, and we're going to give out that first award uh, in uh, Australia in December to a team that has made a, a huge impact uh, for therapy development. So we're going to do that every year, and again, uh, ALS scientists don't need necessarily always that type of incentive, but it never hurts um, to acknowledge the people that really work together to try to make, uh, make a difference for people with ALS. So um, one of the things that we thought was really important in the Healy Center was not, and we've always thought for at MNJH, is that we want to collaborate broadly. So we brought together this amazing group of um, talented scientists from all over the world to be part of our science advisory committee, and their picture is, is there. So we have uh, people who lead all the trials in Asia, Dr. Kim, people who lead all the uh, trials in the Europe, Dr. Amar Ashalabi, uh, people from the United States and from Canada. And this group meets regularly to um, try to be out there finding out what are the best treatments, which are the ones that we should target and bring forward to our patients. And uh, so we're very thankful that they're, they're part of our community here. So uh, today you're gonna to hear about the platform trial. We're very excited about this. Um, we're also gonna to try to uh, share a little bit about these expanded access opportunities and some of the initiatives we're trying to do to make um, access to care and access to trials um, great here at Mass General, but also great all over the country so that no matter where someone lives, they have uh, the best place that they can go to. Um, so with that, um, you're gonna to hear today from the the leader of our uh, motor neuron disease uh, division, which is James Berry. Um, also here from Sabrina Paganoni, who's uh, uh, really spearheading the platform trial. And from Dr. Archana Basu, who's leading a really new initiative we have called Parenting at a Challenging Time. And after that, we'll have a panel discussion where we can answer uh, any of your questions and then some time just to mingle and get to know each other. So uh, I, I, I kindly asked um, uh, one, of, uh, one of my friends now and one of Sean's close friends if he could say a couple words, and that's Pat Ryan, who's the executive chairman of Press Ganey. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Pat Ryan, and uh, I have the privilege of uh, being on the AMG board, and uh, I consider myself Sean Healy's best friend. Uh, he, he hasn't confirmed that yet, but I hope he will. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Merritt uh, one year ago and a little bit more at this very meeting, uh, and at the time it was the day that Sean was diagnosed. And uh, we arrived here in a moment of darkness and this bright ray of sun shined through on us, named Merit Zakovich. Did I get that right? Yeah. I've been. Uh, and it was amazing to meet you and to have the hope and optimism and the commitment and passion that you bring to the ALS community. And so at that meeting, the Healy Center was born. Uh, I think we walked into the parking lot and said, what can we do? We've got to do something. And the concept of bringing drugs to market faster, expanding access, uh, was born out of that session. And uh, at that very moment, I looked at two brilliant minds communicating with one another. Merritt and Sean uh, are quite a team. Uh, for those of you who weren't here earlier, they were back in a conference room game planning on uh, a number of components. And so I, I feel privileged to be able to have the opportunity to work with Merritt. I think we're all privileged uh, and privileged to have uh, the team of uh, Healy and Sokovich uh, going after ALS. And I am certain that this team and the passion and compassion you bring uh, to uh, the world, we will find the cure. So thank you for everything you do. I think on behalf of everyone in the room, uh, we are privileged to know you. So with that said, James, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm excited to, to talk today um, about sort of the year in review and talk a little bit about uh, some of the clinical and research advances uh, in ALS. And, you know, I, I guess I would start by just reiterating that the Sean M. Healy and AMG ALS Center at Mass General is really something that we were just beginning to unlock the potential of, but its founding this year, this last year, really, I think, marks a line in the sand for, for where we accelerate our, our fight against the disease. And m much of what I'll talk about grows out of that. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about clinic expansion and new programs in our clinic, as well as um, sort of um, updates in ALS science and a maturing of the biomarker field, which can help us do uh, uh, trials faster and come to answers more efficiently. Uh, I'll review some of the promising trials that will be reading out results soon or are enrolling now, and then I'll, I'll end by just transitioning into what Sabrina Paganoni is going to talk about, which is a new paradigm for doing ALS trials, which is, again, being facilitated by the founding of the Healy Center. I want to start by just showing uh, sort of pictures of the team. These are the people that, that I work alongside and I'm very proud to be a part of a team with. They're dedicated to caring for and doing research uh, to fight ALS, uh, and, and it's an amazing group of people. Um, and and I'm, I'm just proud to, to be a part of this team. With the work of that hard team, we've been able to expand the programs that, that we have in our clinic. Um, we're, we're entering our third year of the ALS house call program. We're now caring for 25 people with ALS per month at home in nine out of 14 counties in Massachusetts. Uh, it's, it's really been sort of a, a paradigm shift in how we deliver care and, and I think really valuable to the people who are part of that program. We also have introduced the ALS Parenting at a Challenging Time program, or ALS Pact. And this has transitioned over from oncology, and Arch Nabasu is going to talk about this later. The goal of this program is to support people with ALS and caregivers of people with ALS who have children. And it's been really wonderful to watch this program develop in our clinic. We also have an expanded access program, which is nascent and beginning to grow. And this sort of sits at the nexus of, of clinical research and clinical care. And the, the goal here is to provide access to people who might not be able to enroll in a trial uh, for experimental therapies. And that's something that we look forward to growing over time. And lastly, the After Lunch series, which is a, a nursing webinar. We've done two of these this year. These are really aimed at, at sort of helping solve some of the issues that, that people face at home uh, and coming together as a community to, to, to sort of brainstorm together on, on ways to, to have those solutions. Again, we've done two this year. There are more coming, uh, and it's been a great addition to what we do. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about ALS. ALS is more common in people who are older. And you can see here a, a figure that shows us sort of the number of new cases per year by age. And you can see that if we look below 30 to 34 years old, we see very few new cases of ALS. And, and the incidence or the number of cases goes up by age group until you reach about 75 and then comes down. The average age is somewhere between 55 and 60. And, and I think what's really important here is that as our population ages, we're having more people in these high-risk age groups, and we're going to see a growth in the number of cases of ALS. And that could be as much as 70% in upcoming years. So this adds even more, um, I think, uh, um, fire to us because it's more important than ever that we come up with new therapies and cures for the disease. Now, ALS is a disease of the motor neurons. There are two populations of motor neurons. The upper motor neurons uh, are the ones that live in the brain. They send a long projection down to connect to the lower motor neurons, which live in the spinal cord. And those lower motor neurons send a long projection out to the muscle, and that's how we create movement. In ALS, both of these populations of motor neurons are degenerating. There are sporadic and familial forms of ALS. In sporadic forms of ALS, uh, a person's diagnosed with ALS, and there isn't anybody in the family who has had ALS or, or a closely related disorder. Um, and we think that that's, that's not uh, sort of mediated by a single gene mutation. In familial ALS, generally there is another person in the family, usually somebody close, a, a mother or father in general, and maybe half of the family members, in fact, that have been diagnosed with ALS in the past. And this is caused by a mutation in a gene that's passed down through the family that is causative of ALS. And a mutation in a single gene can cause the disease. Now, there are about 30 different genes that can be causative of, of ALS if they have a mutation in them, but any one of them will cause it. Many of them are very rare. There's one that's most common. It's called C9-ORF72, which is a mouthful, but it's already actually a shortening the real name of it. We tend to call this C9. And the second most common one is SOD1. Now, in, as we've learned more about C9, we also find that in some people with apparently sporadic disease, we actually find a mutation in the C9 gene as well. So this has changed our approach to thinking about genetics in people with sporadic ALS, and I think we'll see this changing even more in upcoming years as genetic testing becomes more available and, and we sort of learn more about this. 
whether it's familial or sporadic disease, we don't know the exact cascade of events that goes wrong in the motor neuron, but we do have a lot of, a lot of ideas and a lot of proof for what's going wrong in the motor neuron. So we know that there is oxidative damage. This is free radicals causing problems in the cell. We know that there is excitotoxicity where one sick motor neuron fires too much and overexcites and damages surrounding motor neurons spreading the disease. We know that there's abnormal energy production. We see a loss of what are called axons or nerve endings. We see a, a, um, a breakdown of the, the junction between the nerve and the muscle. And we see inflammation in the brain and the spinal cord, and we see the damage that that causes to motor neurons. The last two things that we see are, are protein clumping in the cells and a problem with something called RNA. Now I'm going to spend one moment to clarify this because in the last year we've learned something really important about this mechanism. So the cell, every cell has a nucleus, which is sort of like a ball in the middle of the cell. And in that nucleus is the genetic material called DNA. And DNA is the blueprint for the cell. Now DNA stays in the nucleus of the cell. And it sends a messenger out from the nucleus into the rest of the cell. And that's called RNA. And RNA carries the message for building the cell. And the building blocks of the cell are protein. So this, the dictum goes DNA creates RNA, RNA creates proteins. Those are the building blocks of the cell. Now, uh, let's see, oh, okay. So um, um, neurons um, have to make these proteins to, to maintain healthy nerve endings. And so you can see the nerve endings here. Um, if our neuron needs to maintain those nerve endings, heal from an injury, or even grow nerve, nerve, uh, nerve endings in the beginning of life, uh, it needs to activate a certain system uh, to make these building blocks. And the first thing it does is it uses something called TDP43 to translate a certain part of that DNA and make RNA. So you can see here that our cell is, is making RNA. And that RNA then is turned into a protein. Again, the building blocks of the cell, these are what we're going to use to make those, those nerve endings. And we don't make just one protein. Many, many proteins are, become the building blocks of the cell. That's what, work, that's what happens when it works. And I want to focus on one, and this is really the discovery in the last year, called Stathman II. Stathman II is absolutely important for building these nerve endings. Now, uh, oh, oh no, my, my beautiful animations. Um, so I'll walk you through it uh, without the animation. So um, TDP43, we've known for a long time in ALS, is mislocalized. So our happy face moves out of the nucleus and it gets stuck in another part of the cell and sequestered. And what happens is, um, we, without TDP43 in the nucleus of the cell, we can't make the RNA, we can't make the protein for Stathman II, and we lose these nerve endings. That is a fundamental discovery in ALS that if it holds up, and I have to say this is early, I'm giving you an overview of the discoveries in the last year, but if it holds up, could be really transformative in the way that we approach ALS. And part of the reason for that is that, um, oh, there we go. So here's our TDP43 that's, that's uh, sequestered out in the cell. And then we have a cascade uh, of events whereby we get a short little piece of, of, of RNA and a short little uh, Stathman II fragment, and we can't build our nerve endings. But it also leads us to a potential treatment for this, because replacing Stathman II could actually help. If we take Stathman II and add that to cells in a Petri dish, we find that their nerve endings uh, maintain fine. This could lead us to a, to a treatment in people. What I will say is that it's not, never quite so straightforward as that because getting a protein into a person's body and then into the brain and spinal cord and, uh, and into the motor neurons is complicated enough to say we probably can't do that. But we're developing gene therapies and gene-directed therapies that will allow us potentially um, to sort of make this kind of change in motor neurons. And a lot of this work is coming from, uh, from genetic studies, that are ge genetic studies, genetic trials that are going on now. And so information we're learning in these gene studies may translate to sporadic ALS as well. Now, a lot of this work came out of Clotilde Lager-Torren's lab. She's the Healy Family ALS Endowed Chair for Research. Again, uh, her funding from uh, the Healy Center has allowed her to focus on some of these incredibly important projects and keep herself in the lab and her lab functioning so that they can bring these discoveries forward faster. Uh, we also work with, with uh, Mark Albers, Gaz Sadri Vakili, Brian Wanger, Matt Frosch. All of these are lab scientists who are making equally important discoveries, which we then talk about on a monthly basis and figure out how we can bring them forward into new therapies in, in clinical trials. 
And I would just say that MGH researchers are really pushing science forward, not just in the basic science realm, but in terms of clinical trials that we're doing, outcome measures that, that we're investigating, um, uh, and new ways to, to care for people in clinic as well. And we're putting these things in the, in the literature so that we can influence the field and, and try to drive us toward cures faster. And we can see evidence of this because one of the things that we've been working on for a long time here are various forms of biomarkers of ALS. And um, we now have biomarkers making their way into clinical trials. So for example, we have PET imaging that can show us neuroinflammation. Suma Babu is working on this. Nazim Atassi is working on this. And this is now something that we can apply to clinical trials, and we're seeing that happen. We can also look at cells in the blood and see abnormalities in inflammation in people with ALS. Um, we have markers of neuronal damage that we can test for in blood and in spinal fluid and can guide our clinical trials. We have uh, muscle strength quantitative measures that we can use to track strength and maybe see changes faster than traditional measures. And we're now doing digital phenotyping, quantifying changes in voice, as well as uh, movement using personal digital uh, devices and, and wearables. And all of these things are allowing us to do more convenient, shorter, faster trials, and they're being built into trials. And I think another thing that's really important is we're incorporating whole genome sequencing into many of our, our our projects, both research and trials. And this will allow us to understand not just genes that are causing ALS, but genes that may slow down ALS or speed up ALS that could be targets for gene therapy as well. Um, how can you help with this? Well, listen, we need people to help us develop these outcome measures so we can put them into trials and do faster research. We need people with ALS to participate, and we need people who don't have ALS to participate so we can compare. Um, and so if you wanted to be involved, you can talk to us today in clinic, between clinic visits. We'd be happy to, to get you involved. I want to talk a little bit about selected ALS trials. Now, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, which is a repository for, um, for clinical trials, there are hundreds that are going on in ALS. Um, these are selected ones. Uh, many of them are enrolling here, given that this is sort of our, our day. I wanted to highlight the ones that, that are going on or have gone on here. The ones in red are currently enrolling, and you'll see that they're, they're in um, really cutting-edge areas like gene therapy and cell therapy and neuroinflammation. These were just, we, we didn't even have these area of trials um, maybe four or five years ago, but now they're becoming really um, the most active areas of clinical trials. Um, in bold, Print, you can see the ones that are actually completing or have completed and are in analysis. So I would say another incredibly exciting thing about where we are currently is that in the next six to nine months, we should have readouts from a number of clinical trials, as many as eight trials. I would also point out that even a trial that doesn't give us a new therapy teaches us something about the disease and acts as a stepping stone so that we can do a better next trial. So regardless of what the outcome of some of these trials is, we'll be closer to a, to a treatment. But there is one trial that is already read out with incredibly exciting results. And this is an early study um, in SOD1 ALS. So this is one of the genetic forms of the, the disease. It's about 2% of people with ALS. And there is a technology called antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, that we're using to, to target SOD1. There was a trial with 50 participants. It was randomized. It started at a low dose and went to a higher dose. And people were followed for three months. And at that highest dose, we saw that the mutated SOD1 protein was reduced in the spinal fluid, that neurofilament, which is a marker of neuronal injury, went down, suggesting less neuronal injury, and that by ALS functional rating scale, vital capacity, and strength, we saw a slowing of decline in these people. So incredibly exciting. The confirmatory trial is enrolling right now, um, and we're really looking forward to that. And I think it has implications not only for people with SOD1 ALS, but for all of the work that we're doing. Um, we want to give people the opportunity to be involved in trials. And so again, you can talk to us really at any time about being involved in trials. Judy Carey is our research access nurse. She's become, in a very complex landscape of trials, she's become really important in helping us organize ourselves. Um, and we're incredibly thankful for the work that Judy does. Um, she has been a lighthouse to so many people who are searching for ways to become involved. She's not the only way to be involved. If you're in clinic, you can ask any of us about it. I'll end by sort of introducing what Sabrina Paganoni is going to talk about next, which is uh, a way to create more efficient trials by reducing startup delays, trial costs, including more people with ALS, reducing the placebo burden, and ultimately finding therapies faster. It's a whole new way of, of doing clinical trials. It's turning everything we do sort of 
maybe not on its head, but on its side anyway. And, and, um, and, and I think will really transform how we do business and, and, and how fast we can find therapies. And it's the Healy ALS platform trial. So Sabrina, you wanna come up and tell us more about that? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm excited to be here and introduce the Healy ALS platform trial. Today, I'll share with you why the Healy platform trial is exactly what we needed in ALS at this time, why we chose a platform approach, and where we stand with the launch of the trial. So why now? Well, we just heard that there's been remarkable progress in our understanding of ALS. And scientists have already identified multiple targets for intervention, so much so that the pharmaceutical uh, industry has been energized, and now we have over 100 companies developing treatments for ALS all over the world. That was not the case, say, five years ago, but it is now, and that's why we need a new way to test as many treatments as possible. So the good news is that Merit and colleagues have uh, founded a network of trial-ready sites that happened about 20 years ago, and the network has grown, and now we have a robust collaborative group of ALS clinics that uh, can enroll people with ALS in trials all over the country. And so now, uh, in a way, we had all the pieces in place. We had many new drugs available to be tested in trials, and we have uh, a lot of expertise around the country, clinics where people with ALS can access trials. But we needed something else. We needed a catalyst to start doing things in a different way. And that catalyst came in the form of the Healy Center, uh, and it was the visionary partnership between Merit and Sean that enabled us to do something that's uh, drastically different, something completely new that was never done before. And that vision inspired others. Many people have really re rallied around the cause, and I just want to acknowledge Mr. Tim Green, a former NFL player, uh, who became so passionate about it that started a fundraising campaign so that anyone who wants to contribute to the trial can do so by joining the campaign. So why platform? Well, we hear from people with ALS that the number one concern is that we want new treatments to be developed as soon as possible. And we learn from our colleagues in cancer that if you use a platform trial approach, you can reduce the time that it takes to develop the first effective treatment by 50%. And you can also reduce the costs. So we thought that that was a great fit for ALS at this time. So how does this work? Well, in a traditional trial, the way we have always been doing trials uh, in ALS and other uh, fields of medicine for, for a long time, you can only test one treatment at a time. In a platform approach, you do something completely different. You test multiple treatments at the same time. So how is it possible? So I'll, I'll tell you how this works. So let me make an analogy. Think of a stadium. So when you uh, run a traditional trial, you can only test one treatment at a time. And you need to build a trial infrastructure or a stadium for that treatment or, or experiment to happen. But then you cannot use that stadium uh, or that infrastructure uh, anymore. You, you, can, you, you can only use it to test one drug. So think about the Patriots. Tomorrow they're going to play. It's as if they had to build a stadium just to play tomorrow's game, a stadium that cannot be used again. In a platform trial, instead, you do something completely different. You build a stadium at the beginning, you keep it open long term, and you use it and reuse it again to test as many drugs as you need until you find the cure for all people with ALS. And that's a, the stadium that we've been building uh, for less than one year. Uh, one year ago, this was just a concept, and actually we spent the last few months building the stadium. It's now ready, and we are now ready to start and launch the trial. So th there's more advantages to this approach, so let me just highlight a few. So in a platform trial, you can do something that would not be possible in a traditional trial, and that's called sharing placebos. So what does this mean? Well, from a patient perspective, you know that in a traditional trial, most of the times, you have a 50-50 chance of being assigned to the actual drug, to active treatment, or to placebo, which is a sugar pill. Now, in a platform trial, the situation is very different. So for every four people that enter the trial, three will get the actual drug, the active treatment, and only one will get placebo. So in a, in a way, uh, that's great because, you know, for, from the patient perspective, you have much higher chances of being on active treatment uh, than you would have in a traditional trial. And that's also okay for the pharmaceutical companies because, as you, as you can see in the graph, at the end 
of the trial, you can actually pull the placebo patients from all the different treatments, and so you can still make meaning, meaningful conclusions from a scientific point of view. And then there's more. Uh, we we talked to, um, to the companies and the FDA, and we really wanted to make sure that the trial would give all patients an option to actually receive active treatment at some point. So the placebo control trial lasts six months. Uh, so again, you had, uh, people have a higher chance of being on active to placebo, uh, but, but there's still a few people who will get placebo for those six months. But then at the end of the trial, everyone who completes the trial has the option to continue on open label extension. So what that means is that everyone who participates is guaranteed that at the end of participation, they will have access to the uh, active treatment uh, for at least one year. And that's true for all the three drugs that um, we're gonna test uh, next. So the, the trial has also a lot of other advantages. One of, uh, one of the scientific advantages is that we can use the trial as an endpoint development engine or a biomarker development engine. So we just heard about biomarkers and how important they are. And so we're gonna develop new biomarkers as part of the trial. So that in addition to testing drugs, we can also contribute to science. Uh, we're gonna test different biomarkers. We're gonna get DNA from everyone, do a whole genome sequencing. We're gonna test neurofilaments, which are a very important biomarker for ALS. Uh, we're also gonna collect samples so that we can make in the future stem cells from all the people that participate in the trial. And, and the reason for that is, is, is the following. So we know that there are now new ways of uh, testing drugs in the lab using someone's stem cells. So that's basically a way to do the trial in, in the lab before uh, you, know, you even need to, uh, to expose the person to, to the drug. You can try to, to, to be able to test in, in, the, in the lab if that person is likely to respond to that drug or not. Now the techniques, the techniques for that are not completely there yet, but there are other programs such as uh, a program called Answer ALS, where we are learning how to do that. And we actually spoke uh, with the people who uh, work for, uh, with Answer ALS, and many of us um, actually in the, in the room contribute to that project as well. And there are ways that we, we can synergize with Answer ALS so that we can learn, as soon as we learn from them, how we can test drugs in the lab using someone's stem cells. We will already have the material uh, from participants in the trial to be able to do that. And that's gonna allow us to continue to improve the trial as we learn more from either this trial or other projects so that we can continue to do better and make the trial even more efficient. So where do we stand with the trial? The trial will start enrolling in early 2020. So we selected the, five, the first five drugs that will be tested uh, as part of this trial, and they are listed here. We're gonna start with three, and then add number four and number five shortly thereafter, but uh, we continue to accept nominations, submissions. Uh, we know that there are more companies that want to participate. The first five was, were selected by a group of scientists, and it was a competitive process. So uh, we had uh, almost 30 applications, and the first five were selected based on the scientific promise. And so, um, these drugs are very different to each other. They have a few things in common. The first thing I would say is that they're not supplements, they're not repurposed drugs. They are brand new drugs that have been developed based on solid science. They all have uh, solid uh, preclinical evidence that makes them you know, a very promising for ALS. They've also all been uh, tested uh, in early trials, either in healthy volunteers or in people with other diseases, so that we know it's safe to now expose people with ALS to these drugs to see if they can actually be an effective treatment for ALS. Uh, they work on different pathways. Uh, some of them, three of them, work on neuroinflammation. We just heard about the importance of neuroinflammation, uh, but they do so in very different ways. So for example, the one from Ra Pharma works on the complement uh, signal, which is one way uh, the immune system responds to uh, bacteria. Uh, and when that response um, doesn't work well in ALS, then what happens is that the nerve cells will be damaged and the drug developed by Raf Pharma blocks that uh, pathway. The drug developed by Biohaven works on something else, a different part of the immune system called macroglia, which are the inflammatory cells in the brain. And the drug uh, made by Implicit works on something called CD14. This drug is a, um, a monoclonal antibody and regulates the crosstalk between macroglia in the brain and Tregs in the, in the blood. And the other two drugs, uh, the one by, uh, made by Clean works on energy production uh, and the one by Prilenia works on something else, a sigma-1 receptor, which modulates how proteins are transported between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. 
And so when, uh, when that process is not working right, uh, proteins will accumulate and will be deposited and aggregated. Uh, and now the, the drug helps clear that. Now, this is a lot of information. I just want to let you know that we have a short description of each of these drugs on our website. So if you're interested, you can read more about it. And then Dr. Sadri Vakili will be here during the Q&A session. And um, she's one of our scientists, and she works on some of these mechanisms. So if you have more questions, we can clarify that later. The trial will enroll at 54 sites around the country. Uh, we want to bring the trial close to where people live so that as many people as possible can participate. And hopefully as we add more drugs and we continue to expand, we will add more sites. So in summary, we are on a mission to develop many new uh, effective treatments for ALS. And we will continue to test new drugs until we find a cure for all people with ALS. And to conclude, I would like to thank Merit, Sean, his family, friends, our collaborators and supporters uh, for bringing all of those, these new opportunities to the ALS community. Thank you. And now allow me to introduce Dr. Bazu, a psychologist in our program. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today on behalf of the MGH ALS Parenting at a Challenging Time program. Um, we collaborate with Healy Center patients who are parents as they support their children's adjustment to a parent's diagnosis of ALS. We know that families experience the impact of ALS uh, in all aspects of their lives, in terms of their professional roles, activities, relationships, and importantly, in terms of their family roles. In particular, the role of being a parent is central to the identity of adults with children. And um, this means that when uh, there are changes in how we interact with our children or are able to care for them, it also affects how we feel about ourselves. Based on census data, we know that roughly one third of patients with ALS are also parents and have parenting dependent children. So typically infants through young adulthood about the age of 25. And if we include grandparents who have active roles in caring for grandchildren, this proportion of parenting dependent children is even higher. So finding ways to support our patients in their roles as parents has the potential to benefit many people um, in our clinic. Recognizing this need and an opportunity to enhance the multidisciplinary care at the Healy Center, over the past several years, the ALS team um, piloted a very limited collaboration with the Marjorie E. Corf Parenting at a Challenging Time program, which was an existing program in the MGH Cancer Center. The program was founded by our director, Dr. Paula Rausch, um, in 1988 and Dr. Cindy Moore joined the team in 2003. Today, about five clinicians and a postdoctoral fellow work with parents while they receive um, cancer care at MGH. And in the past 12 years, they have worked with over 3,000 parents of more than 6,500 children. When philanthropic support from the EGL Charitable Foundation became available about a year ago, we were eager to build on this limited collaboration as well as our experience from the Cancer Center to create a program that was exclusively designed for the ALS clinic. I joined Dr. Rausch and Dr. Moore in January 2019, building on my experience of more than 15 years as a psychologist doing clinical work and research with families in issues related to trauma, grief, and concerns of depression and anxiety. We meet parents and grandparents in the clinic during their routine and follow-up visits. We also offer phone calls and virtual visits. Until date, since mid-January of 2019, we have consulted with over 75 parents and grandparents. The overarching goal of PACT is to support children's coping, adjustment, and capacity to thrive in the face of a parent's life-limiting diagnosis. We believe that parents know their children well and that they are active and passionate um, advocates who can reach out for community support for their families. So our intent is not to provide weekly psychotherapy either to the parents or to the children, but rather we bring our expertise in mental health and child development 
as well as an understanding of how serious medical conditions can impact family dynamics to collaborate with parents as they support their children. I'm highlighting here some of the major evidence-informed aspects of our PACT consultations that aim to enhance children's coping and resilience. For example, one of the key things that we collaborate on parents on is in their efforts to engage in open, honest, and age-appropriate communication with their children as they try to help them understand ALS, make sense of the changes that they might already be seeing, anticipate upcoming changes, and to feel supported throughout the course of a parent's illness. Many factors play a role in how and when a parent may communicate with their children about the diagnosis. There's certainly no one-size-fits-all model. For example, how we might explain ALS to a preschooler can sound very different than how we might think about communicating with a teenager who can cognitively process information much like an adult and is also likely to look up information online. Children have unique personalities and temperaments. Some are more expressive, more likely to ask questions or express worry. Others may be quiet thinkers or internal processors. Families also have specific cultural beliefs that can play a role in how they choose to communicate with their children. Also, every parent's progression is different. So we speak with parents closely as well as with our neurology medical colleagues to understand every parent's unique medical presentation to consider how to share information with their children. In addition to communicating information about ALS, we also work with parents in supporting them in talking to their children about their children's emotional experiences. Ways to understand, acknowledge, and validate the feelings that tend to evolve over the course of a parent's illness. This is also important because it gives us an important window into how and when children might need additional support such as professional psychotherapy. Coping with ALS certainly takes a village and we encourage parents to consider all the different communities in which they participate as sources of support for themselves and their children be it their children's school guidance counselor or teachers, neighbors, faith-based organizations, patient advocacy groups, parents of children's close friends. Families also sometimes share with us that um, they are sometimes overwhelmed or tired by the numerous offers of support. And we talk to them about um, how to maximize the numerous offers of support that they get. Protecting child-centered routines and family time is also very high on our priority list. We think together with parents about ways to minimize disruptions to children's routines, either because of increased medical appointments or because a parent is less physically available to participate in a child's activities. Maintaining children's routines can be important in communicating a sense of predictability and stability at a time when so much can feel out of control. Parents and children alike also view family-centered time as being valuable to creating experiences and also an opportunity for regular check-ins. Children, and certainly teenagers, don't always want to be asked about how they're doing, but creating the time and space to do that is certainly valuable for parents and children alike. Being attuned to children and supporting them takes a lot of emotional reserves as the family as a whole is also coping with the diagnosis. And so if parents keep depleting themselves and don't take the time to prioritize activities that help them feel replenished, it can be hard to stay in this marathon. So good self-care we believe is critical not only for yourself but also in supporting your children. It's not selfish but can easily be forgotten. So part of our work is to support parents in investing in their own networks of support. Consistent with the goals of the Healy Center of Excellence, our future programming efforts involve both learning and teaching opportunities. There is in fact very limited and almost non-existent research on parenting-related concerns unique to ALS at different stages. To address this, we are currently in the process of developing a systematic needs assessment for our parents in the Healy Center. Our goal is to use information for such, from such a systematic evaluation to inform and establish best practices for responding to parents' needs in supporting their children. 
And finally, as developments for treatments of ALS forge ahead at MGH and elsewhere, we will work closely with our neurology colleagues to tailor our family-based services um, to care for patients, but also to pursue collaborative training and teaching opportunities. This is our contact information, and there's more of that in our program brochure, which is available uh, both in clinic and soon to be available online. I'd also just like to highlight that um, our Cancer Center PACT colleagues have developed an online course for professionals working with parents with serious medical conditions. Although this is not specific to ALS at this time, many of the PACT uh, principles are the same. Um, the program will be offered again uh, through the MGH Psychiatry Academy in spring 2020. Um, Dr. Rausch, our founder and director, has also written a book uh, which can be a valuable resource for parents to consider. With that, I'd like to first and foremost acknowledge the Healy Center Parents and Families. It is our privilege to collaborate with you. The EGL Charitable Foundation makes our program possible and our colleagues in the Healy Center medical team with whom we collaborate on supporting our patients. So I believe we'll have a brief intermission uh, followed by a panel discussion that'll begin in approximately 10 minutes. Um, there are some index cards, I believe, in the brochures, but also there are folks around the room with that um, if you have questions for us. <laughs> 